Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about convalescent plasma as a potential therapy for coronavirus or the COVID-19. The FDA issued an emergency use authorization on August 23rd. They said that the material shows promise, shows effectiveness, benefits outweigh the risks, can shorten the duration of illness, decrease the severity of illness, get you out of the hospital potentially even faster than otherwise. But they said it's not yet a standard of therapy and that there are really no controlled trials that show that it works. Well, the EUA, the Emergency Use Authorization, supposedly is for those conditions for which there's no other available therapy, but at least in the form of COVID-19, we have remdesivir, we have dexamethasone. Well, the government said, well, look, it's really just to ease the clerical burden on hospitals so we can get it to more patients. But there are several issues. Number one, at the present time, even before the EUA, an average of about 1,500 patients every single day are treated with the convalescent plasma here in the United States. And then the second issue is availability. This isn't something like a pill that you can go over to the store and purchase. You have to have the people go and donate. So we have a finite limit to that. Well, at the time of the press conference on August 23rd, the president said it's a powerful therapy, it's a breakthrough therapy, concurrence from other administration officials. But we've known about the therapy for a long time, since the 1890s when it was used to treat diphtheria. Then 1918 used to treat the flu pandemic used as a treatment for scarlet fever between the 1920s and 1940s, used for pertussis up until the 1970s, used for measles, a variety of other kind of infectious viruses, used for SARS-1, the kind from 2002, used for MERS, used for Lassa fever, used for Ebola, all with varying degrees of success, but sort of fell out of favor after the 1940s because we had the antibiotics. But remember, antibiotics are only for bacterial infections, so we have viral infections. And the question is, what do we do for the viruses? Well, convalescent plasma might be a choice, but you have to realize that your body starts making the antibodies average of about 10 days to 14 days after infection. So if the convalescent plasma is going to be of any value, it has to be used relatively early. You donate just like you're donating blood, except they use a centrifuge to pull out the plasma and return the white blood cells and the red blood cells. The plasma can be used either fresh or more typically it's stored frozen to less than minus 18 degrees centigrade, could be used for up to a year after the time of its collection. Once it's thawed, can be kept in the refrigerator for a period of up to about five days. Each individual apheresis or plasma donation can provide about 400 to 800 milliliters. That's enough for about two to four units of convalescent plasma. As a reference, a soda can has about 355 milliliters. So when we're talking about donation, you're donating somewhere between one and about two and a half cans of soda frozen within a period of about 24 hours. Theoretically, you could donate every two weeks for a period of up to about six months. When you donate, we know that at least for the first seven or eight times, there's not going to be any significant decrease in the level of antibodies. But some people who are going to receive the material, well, we have an issue. We have an issue with heart failure. So especially in the elderly population, if an individual has heart failure, well, they might not be able to accept the full 200 milliliters. And one unit is 200 milliliters. The average is one unit, and then perhaps four or five or six days later, perhaps a second unit is necessary. Also a problem if the person has a history of allergies. And when the person donates, then the convalescent plasma has to be checked to make sure it's not carrying HIV or hepatitis B or hepatitis C virus or a variety of other kind of either viral or bacterial conditions. 
when you donate should be at least 14 days or more after your acute symptoms resolve. In the convalescent plasma, there are neutralizing antibodies, but there are a variety of other kinds of antibodies. So the neutralizing antibodies tend to be the IgG type 1 or 3. There are a variety of other. We have the IgM, we have the IgA. You tend to seroconvert, like I said, anywhere in the range of 8 days to 21 days after the infection. We like a high titer of the antibodies. So it's not just a little bit of antibodies. We like those people who have a lot of antibodies. And the antibodies do a lot of other things. It's not just the neutralizing antibodies, but we also have antibodies that activate complement or the antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity or they stimulate the phagocytosis so cells gobble up the viruses. And then we have the non-neutralizing antibodies that seem to be effective in addition but through different unexplained manner. Well, some people shouldn't donate, so elderly individuals who have comorbid diseases and, as a matter of fact, people who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic with their COVID-19, those individuals tend to have relatively low titer of antibodies, so they're not very helpful. As a matter of fact, if we look at people who have significant infection, if we look at them a month after they improve, well, about 20%, or one in five, don't have any neutralizing antibodies as opposed to, say, the original SARS, SARS type 1, the kind from 2002, where after 9 to 17 years, people still maintained their level of neutralizing antibodies. How do people find out about donations? Well, you find out when you're discharged from the hospital, the medical staff discusses with you, or through advertising, or through the media. There are some side effects associated with uh, receipt of the convalescent plasma. So some people, women, carry antibodies to HLA or to human neutrophils. And in those individuals, if the convalescent plasma is transfused, it might lead to transfusion-related acute lung injury. So the blood has to, or the, the plasma has to be checked. We also know that it's easy to overload the system. So we have transfusion-associated cardiac overload, or TACO. Then we have the hemolytic syndrome, where the blood can break down inside the system. We also have hypothermia. It can make a person much too cold, have the potential for purpura. And then there's a condition of antibody-dependent enhancement of infection. So you receive the convalescent plasma it helps treat or neutralize the virus, but then that doesn't allow your immune system to be stimulated. So the theory is that if you receive a related virus, if you're infected with a related virus, then maybe that would cause a significant problem. Well, we know that's an issue with dengue fever. We don't know about with the coronavirus. And then there are some other kind of issues. Some people don't make any IgA. It's another type of immunoglobulin. Well, if you don't make that, then if you receive the convalescent plasma from someone who does, that might lead to some significant issues. It seems that convalescent plasma doesn't have any more side effect in older individuals than it does in younger individuals, but we don't know about pediatric population less than age 18 or pregnant women or women who are nursing. So remember, the EUA came out on August 23rd. August 22nd, the day before, President Trump was complaining of the deep state or whoever over at the FDA making it difficult for the drug companies to get people in the studies so that we could test some of the vaccines and the therapeutics. According to him, the FDA obviously wanted to delay the approval of a variety of different kinds of substances until after the election. Well, the next day, the FDA bowed to pressure and said, at least according to Trump, that we have a truly historic announcement. It's going to save lives. We have a beautiful ingredient in the veins of people who survived the coronavirus infection. Said it helped more than 50% of the people, but the next day, or the day of the announcement, that number was down to about 35%. How did 
President Trump even become familiar with uh, convalescent plasma? There's the suggestion that a doctor from Columbia University went on the Fox Business Network in March and he touted the benefits, the potential benefits. And that seems to be one of the ways that the president might have learned of this material. But remember that the EUA doesn't necessarily mean that we have a substance that really works. Look at the hydroxychloroquine or the chloroquine. The FDA bowed to political pressure, approved the material, and then within a period of several months that had to be taken off the market because it was found to be more harmful and not helpful. Well, question is, did the president really pressure the FDA? And there's a suggestion that uh, the administration might have done just that. Now, according to the FDA, no, 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 no. We did an independent analysis. We looked at more than 12 studies. We decided that it was promising, that it was safe and efficacious. And they said they looked at a lot of raw material, looked at the preclinical studies in animals, looked at studies from a variety of different countries. But now remember, it was on August 23rd that the EUA was authorized. Okay. Well, on August 19th, just four days prior, we had Dr. Anthony Fauci from the NIAID. We had Dr. Francis Collins, who is the director of the entire National Institutes of Health. And we had Dr. Clifford Lane, who's the clinical director of studies at the NIAID. All of those individuals said that we don't have strong enough information to support an emergency use approval of uh, convalescent plasma. And as a matter of fact, they said that if you do authorize it, they were going to have an issue with people not wanting to participate in randomized controlled trials. And randomized controlled trials are the only way that we're going to get to the point where we can say whether the material is helpful or not. Well, there's this 35% figure. According to Dr. Hahn of the FDA, he says he was a clinical oncologist prior to the time when he became the FDA commissioner. So a 35% reduction means 35 out of 100 people would have survived if they received the plasma. Well, people scratched their head. They said, where did that number come from? It wasn't in any of the material submitted to the FDA. It wasn't in any of the material that the FDA published. And as a matter of fact, basically, as soon as Dr. Hahn said that, there was blowback because people said that's not what any of the studies showed. It's a number without meaning. It's a gross over-exaggeration. So actually, most people who receive the convalescent plasma, they don't seem to improve at all. If we look at the overall death rate, it's unchanged in those people who receive or don't receive the convalescent plasma. If there's going to be any benefit, it's going to be limited to those people who are treated within 72 hours, within three days from the onset of symptoms, who are less than age 80, who have less severe illness, and who have high levels of antibodies in the convalescent plasma that they receive. Well, when asked about this 35% number from the spokesperson at the FDA, there was some equivocation. That person subsequently fired. And then we have Dr. Peter Marks, also of the FDA, he said that, yeah, we did our own analysis of material from the Mayo Clinic and the expanded access program. And what we found was that compared to people who had low levels of antibodies, those people who had high levels of antibodies in their, in the, in their plasma, in the convalescent plasma, well, it seemed that those people, if they were treated within a period of three days, it seemed to be about a 35% reduction. But no randomized controlled trial. And Dr. Casa Duval, who was part of the Mayo Clinic study, he was asked where the 35% number, 35 number came from. He said, I don't know. Dr. Topol said, unless there's a correction on this, we have low credibility at the FDA. Dr. Swami Nathan, who's the chief scientific officer at the World Health Organization, he said at the moment, 
still very low quality of evidence. So there's another issue. When you think of an acetaminophen, or you think of the remdesivir, or you think of the dexamethasone, a pill is a pill is a pill. It doesn't make any difference whether you get your pill in Seattle, whether you get it in San Francisco, whether you get it in Kansas City or in Boston. On the other hand, there is significant variation, not only from donation to donation, person to person, if we look at those people who donate the plasma, but as I mentioned before, there's regional variation. So if you donate in Los Angeles, we're going to find that it's a different serum, different level of antibodies, different kind of antibodies, at least in part, from people who donate in Baltimore. So that's a very important point. And we also know that there's significant variation in the level of antibodies. Some people have lots of antibodies, some people have low levels of antibodies. So supposedly the material is supposed to be labeled. Well, what kind of information do we have to suggest it works? So they did some animal studies in hamsters. We usually do them in mice, but mice aren't susceptible to the coronavirus infection. So in the hamsters who were infected, then the next day they received some of the convalescent plasma. Those animals seem to do better than animals who were infected. And then on the second day, received some of the convalescent plasma. There were some small Chinese studies that came out and showed that if people were treated within one to three days after they were infected, that maybe they would have a decrease in some of the symptoms. But the biggest study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, or JAMA, online on June the 3rd. And what they found was that they looked at a randomized controlled trial in seven different medical centers in Wuhan, China, where the virus seemed to have originated. They could only find 103 people who were confirmed patients. They had hoped to get 200 patients, but what they found was there was no mortality benefit at 28 days. They did find, however, there was some clinical improvement. It was not significant after 28 days except in those individuals who supposedly were severely infected. Those, that subgroup seemed to have improved. People with life-threatening disease, they didn't improve. Another study in the Netherlands, well, it found that on treating people at 10 days after the symptoms were present, range anywhere between 6 and 15 days, well, it was found that those people already had relatively high levels of antibodies, the same as the convalescent plasma that they would have received. So, as a matter of fact, there was no benefit, no benefit in mortality, no benefit in length of hospitalization, severity of the disease. Another study from Methodist hospitals in Houston, Texas, American Journal of Pathology, preliminary data. What they did is they used one unit and another unit in those people who were worsened, at least as far as the x-ray or the CAT scan, or they needed more oxygen. They looked at 136 patients who received the convalescent plasma, looked at about 240 people who received the standard kind of therapy, and what they found was that, again, if they were treated within three days of admission, and they received levels of convalescent plasma that had very high levels of antibodies, then those individuals seemed to do much better and had a reduced mortality rate. But the biggest study is the Mayo Clinic Expanded Access Program. That's supported by the federal government from BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. It's been in existence, the study, the Expanded Access Program, since April of 2020, it has more than 100,000 enrollees, more than 70,000 people were treated. They were treated in almost 2,800 different acute medical centers here in the United States, treated by more than 14,000 different doctors. And by the end of August, there was no demonstrated clinical benefit for the overwhelming majority of patients. So we don't know whether it's going to be helpful or harmful. That's the bottom line. But what they did is they looked at the therapy solely as a bridge 
for those patients who didn't have any studies that were ongoing at hospitals where they were admitted. So they expected to have maybe about 5,000 individuals who enrolled, well it burgeoned up to more than 100,000 as I mentioned. So these were performed or treated in hospitals where they didn't have the structure for clinical investigations. And that's very important because what that means is that we have a lot of data, but we don't know what any of the data means. Now, overall, it seems that those people who were treated in March and April and May, those people seem to have a more severe illness than the people who were treated more recently in June, July, and August. So if we look at the crude seven-day mortality in people who received the therapy within three days and they received the therapy in April or May, then the death rate was about 13%. It fell to about 6%. Same therapy, same everything when those people were treated in June, July, and August. Well, it's important to realize that the treatment is getting more rapid or being administered more rapidly. So if we look at those patients who were originally treated in March, April, and May, well, only about a quarter of them received the therapy by the third day of therapy or by the third day of illness. If we look at the people treated later on, June, July, and August, at least half of the people received their therapy by the third day. Now, if we look overall, if you receive the therapy, the seven-day mortality, when you look at all of the patients treated within three days of the diagnosis, the seven-day mortality is about 9%, a little less than 9%, in people who received the convalescent plasma, people who didn't receive the convalescent plasma until the fourth day or later, the mortality rate was about 12%. So they know 35% in this. So about 3,000 patients received only one unit. The rest received two units or sometimes even more. Survival benefit seemed to be in those patients who were treated early, treated with high levels of antibody, and people who were less severely ill. Those people who were more severely ill, treated with lower titer of antibody, treated in a different manner, didn't seem to do nearly as well. So here's where the 35% number comes from. So if we look at the people who were treated high antibody titer versus low antibody titer, if we look at the death rate at seven days, it was reduced by about 35% in those individuals who received the therapy within the first three days. If we look at the 30-day survival, well, it was down to significantly less. So the death rate at 30 days, even if you received the high levels of antibody, it was about reduced by about 23 percent. Reduced to 23 percent. So what's the meaning of all of this? The meaning is that we have political pressure and we have political pressure on the FDA for the emergency use authorization, not only of the hydroxychloroquine, not only of the convalescent plasma, but now we have the issue with the vaccine. And because Dr. Hahn has lost his credibility because of some silly statements that he made, because he bowed the pressure with the uh, hydroxychloroquine. The question is, can we believe what the Food and Drug Administration is going to say about the vaccine? Add to this a meeting that occurred on July 30th, where top administration officials evidently told Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer that the administration might grant emergency approval to a vaccine before phase three trials are completed here in the United States. And then we have on top of all of this, we have political pressure from the administration on the Centers for Disease Control. They changed the guidelines for testing very recently. President Trump says we test too much. So now the CDC guidelines say, hey, look, if you've been exposed and you don't have any symptoms, you don't need any kind of test. Absolute nonsense. Well, where did this latest kerfuffle come from? Well, according to the administration, they said that the White House task force, they actually made the decision 
and Brett Girard, he said that the task force approved it. But actually, at the time when the task force was supposedly approving this, we had Dr. Fauci under general anesthetic receiving some surgery on his vocal cords. So now we have a doctor who is part of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, Dr. Scott Atlas, who's a neuroradiologist. He's not got any credibility in infectious diseases, but his theories about the disease seem to merge with the president's. So the president seems to be listening to him. Well, according to the CDC, these new guidelines for limiting the testing come from the administration. They were written not by people at the CDC. So experts talking about these revisions say they're indefensible. It's a sad day for American medicine. Go against the best interest of public health. We're fighting a pandemic. And we're getting the administration that's anti-scientific saying what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Well, that's a problem. It's a sad day for American medicine, for public health, when those people who seem to disregard scientific information, scientific information that should dictate health strategy in a manner that is helpful to the human epidemic that we're suffering, well, what we really need is more testing, not less testing. We need more evaluation of medicines and plasma therapies and vaccine. We don't need any more of this cutting corners. Can't do that. Now, as far as the convalescent plasma is concerned, is it an advance or not? Well, the administration's had a half of the year of the virus that we've known about to establish some randomized controlled trials with regard to the convalescent plasma. And without those trials that have been not yet produced, not yet done, do we know whether the convalescent plasma is going to be of any value? The answer is at the present time, no, unfortunately. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.